Do you like want to go, Chair? Right, thank you. Alex, do you want to do your thing first? Cass it on my happy. I'm out. I'll right put, put it on that. Senator notes. Fawcett. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr Skidmore, welcome. Um, just got a few questions for you about some of the regulatory reform process that's underway. Uh, overview question first, the broad implementation of the Forsyth recommendations. Could you give the committee an update as to where you see that process is at? Mark Skidmore, Chief Executive Officer, CASA. Senator, uh, the Aviation Safety Regulation Review Report um, included 37 recommendations from memory. 32 of those relate to CASA. But in regards to the implementation of those, we're continuing to work on the recommendations. The uh, implementation plan is incorporated in our, cor in our uh, corporate plan and we're hitting the K well we're addressing the KPIs and the performance in regards to those and reporting back through the department to the minister on those but the, the overarching i guess uh, status of the recommendations is probably best covered by the department in regards to a departmental response but i think CAS is still online in regards to addressing those i can't say exactly which ones have already been implemented but there's a number HSB MOU uh, we're working on the the um, regulation development, the reform, as you stated, in regards to the number of regulations still to be implemented. There's 12 regulations still to be implemented at this stage, our outstanding, if you want to specifically go down those. Uh, but on the ASRR, I think we're, we're tracking along in regards to meeting our recommendations. Mm -hmm. Perhaps if you could uh, take on notice then the ones that are outstanding, uh, just your um, time frame that you see to actually finish incorporating those would be useful. Thank you. For the ASRR recommendations? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, broad comment, particularly around the, um, the statement of your regulatory philosophy. Uh, that's been broadly welcomed by most of the stakeholders I've engaged with in the industry, so thank you for that. I look forward to seeing that pursued with, uh, with some vigour. Um, can I just go to some detailed issues? Uh, CAO 48.1 um, my understanding is that several industry sectors have been engaging with CASA and particularly the EMS sector um, looking to have a specific appendix uh, drafted for them uh, and my understanding is that most stakeholders had agreed on a form but that seems to have been delayed in being issued in terms of certainty and particularly I'm aware there are some who are looking to sign or bid for contracts with state governments, the uncertainty around that is causing issues. And just wondering if you have an update on uh, 48.1, and particularly for the EMS and air ambulance sectors. Yeah, you know, certain, certainly, Senator, this CAO 48.1 is the fatigue risk management section, and it really has, um, we're trying to implement a, a new and modern fatigue risk management system. There's a lot of, there is a lot of discussion going on with industry at the moment because there's a number of interested parties in regards to getting this right. I've taken a bit of a pause in that at this stage because I want to make sure we've got the underlying data, the scientific evidence to actually demonstrate the requirements behind a fatigue risk management system, which I think are there. Everyone understands that fatigue is an issue and we need to understand how to manage that appropriately. But there is work to be done, and especially in the, um, the uh, emergency management system area. It might be best if um, I get my executive, acting executive manager of standards to come up and, and address that in particular. Sure. While he's coming up, can I ask, ask a, a policy and principle type question? If, given you've put a delay on this and there was already some concern about the uncertainty, if a company signed a contract or bid to win a contract with the state government based on a certain rostering level, uh, the number of pilots it would need to have to meet the, the new fatigue risk management requirements, well, sorry, if they, if they bid on the current ones, because they don't know what the future ones will be, uh, and then the future ones change, would there be any grandfathering so that that company could continue to work on the cost basis that it bid for? Or halfway through a contract, would they be obligated to change, having bid to win the contract on the, the current cost structure? I think that's an interesting situation that we find ourselves in, and it would be a case of uh, considering the requirements for an exemption or grandfathering in that case. Would it be fair to say you haven't thought of that? 
specifics of an actual contract, no, Senator, but in regards to how we would process that, we could certainly process That's exemptions. Very good question. So you glanced there at Dr. Alec. So Dr. Alec, can I uh, take from your lack of a nod or a, a shake of the head that uh, you have no position on that, no. or is that something that is a possibility so that industry can move forward? Senator Jonathan Alec, Associate Director of Aviation Safety. I thought I had nodded that uh -huh. um, the regulations as they exist now and the policy that was uh, articulated in the regulatory philosophy and the, and the CEO's directive makes it clear that we do take these things into account and amongst other things, an exemption would certainly be entertained on that basis. Okay, thank you. Hansard finds it hard to pick up a nod, so thank you for putting that uh, on the record. Um, the feedback we've had from some operators is that they're happy to look at conducting the trials that are required to actually get information and data to support their FRMS. But they're indicating that uh, the, the conduct of the trial and the form the data needs to be supplied in that there's scant detail available from CASA. So perhaps Mr Weeks is the, the appropriate person to direct that question to. But if you could uh, talk to the committee about that, because if, clearly if we're expecting industry to come on board, CASA needs to be providing that framework for them. Um, thank you, Senator. Roger Weeks, Acting Executive Manager Standards. We have arranged a industry workshop um, that will be held in Melbourne uh, early November and that workshop uh, invitations have gone out to all operators that have expressed an interest in um, undertaking the trial for the fatigue risk management system and that workshop is designed to take them through the process so it's very much uh, what the trial is aimed to do and the information that they would need to provide during that trial. So that's the purpose of the, the workshop in Melbourne, is mm -hmm. to take industry and provide industry with exactly that detail. Mm -hmm. Okay. So provide the detail or help have industry help develop the detail? I'm just wondering if an operator, for example, is based in Darwin, whether that's reasonable for the regulator to expect them to travel to Melbourne just to receive information, or is the workshop indeed a workshop for them to have input into the conduct? Um, Senator, I'd need to look. I, I haven't seen the final agenda yet, so I, I don't know the exact detail that will be covered. Um, that would be something I'd need to take on notice and uh, come back with uh, what the agenda, um, what the okay, workshop is. Okay, but at a broad position, though, if you're in charge of this process, mm then I would have assumed that you would know whether this was an information session where you are just telling operators what's required mm. or whether your intent is that this is a co-regulatory approach where they help develop the requirements. Do you know in a binary sense? Is it information giving or is it a collaborative effort? Uh, my understanding is that it will be collaborative um, because we have uh, a number of speakers that are there. We've, we have an expert coming out from New Zealand who will be um, presenting at the, at the workshop as well. But I, I, I don't have the detail. I'm sorry, Senator. I, I would need to get that for you. So sorry. Sometimes we find that these become a bit of both, Senator. They might, end up, might start as inf inf informative and then end up being more collaborative as we develop the information together. I guess what I'm interested in here, Mr Skidmore, is in parlance you would understand the commander's intent. If Mr Weeks is, is running this process, then I would have thought he would have had a clear intent for the outcome that this meeting would have achieved. And I guess that's what I'm just seeking to understand, that I'm, I'm not getting a, a solid feeling that you had a clear outcome in mind for this meeting. Can I just uh, help Mr. Weeks, Mr Weeks there? He's only been just placed recently in the position of acting executive manager of standards, so he might be pick, picking up a process that was already in place. So I think it would be best for us to go back, make sure we got the correct information and then let you know exactly what was intended. That's probably a fair defence for a recent appointment. Thank you. Um, part 61. <clears throat> My understanding is that there was supposed to be a revised manual of standards issued in September for part 61, um, but that that is not yet uh, on the streets. Could somebody give me an update as to what's occurring there? I think in regards to, I'm not sure of the exact status of the time frame for the revised manual standards. We'd have to check that and, and get the information back to you, Senator. Okay. My understanding is Mr Crosswaite replied um, 
in May of this year that the amendment to MOS was planned by September this year. So uh, I can actually clarify that, Senator, is now planned for the drafting instructions were being written to address a number of issues and we're expecting an amendment to the 61 MOS in December of 2015. Okay, so what's the corresponding time frame then that you will be expecting industry to comply with the contents of the new manual of standards? Because my understanding is there have been some previous iterations where it was issued on day X and day X plus one industry were being required to comply with it and we were seeing flying schools not able to conduct uh, tests and other activities. So I'm just interested to know what adjustment time you'll be providing industry before they're expected to require uh, apply this well, new Well, pilots test. still have up until the 31st of August 2018 for the transition. So the, the four years, is that correct? Did I get that timing right? The three year, tra uh, four year transition, that's correct, still applies. Mm -hmm. And we'll work with the industry as we develop up the manual standards and work with them to understand the implications of it. If, mm -hmm. if there's a request for additional timing, then I'll have to take that, I'll take that into account. Sure, okay. Um, and so in terms of the way that will be communicated to industry, is that through, um, you'd be writing to people to get their input, workshops, how? I came out earlier this year, Senator, with a, a letter to everyone asking them for input in regards to Part 61, and I still look forward to getting a lot of information from people regarding Part 61 if they have concerns. Mm -hmm. We have received some input so far. I, I do not have the exact numbers of the actual feedback, mm -hmm. but uh, every single forum I go to, I ask for information and feedback regarding it, and I've mm -hmm. just recently been to Kununurra and Broome and Mildura doing forums, and we're continuing mm -hmm. that uh, around Australia. And I would, I would envy, I'd be very happy for anyone to provide me with any information they can regarding Part 61. Okay, thank you. Um, 